Okay, doctors, it is top of the hour. And I got to thank at uh, the end of the year, here it is. I got to uh, uh, thank all of you who have uh, stood by these uh, webinars. And uh, obviously with the thanks of, of having uh, so many people put these events together, I just want to take this moment and thanking every single one who's involved in educating uh, doctors like us uh, and helping us move the needle with our patients. And again, uh, some of the locations that I know from East Coast to West Coast, those of you who are on, uh, it is a, a time of, of, of uh, uh, giving thanks and happy holidays. But uh, moving of the subject line now for the new year, I uh, have a lot of good things in store for us. Uh, one of the subjects I wanted to kind of uh, finish up is our conversation. We talked about osteoperforation. We talked about high frequency vibration. We know about its effectiveness, but um, how do we integrate this and, and talk a little bit more deeper clinically? And I have a couple of cases to share with you that are my updated cases. And uh, those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Dr. Atai, um, one of the, uh, um, uh, I guess you can call speakers uh, 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 and KOLs of multiple companies. Uh, I'm not employed by any dental company but I have done uh, my fair share of clinical cases, uh, treatments with uh, using Invisalign system, the, obviously the, the Propel Orthodontics, who uh, one of the sponsors, as well as the uh, evaluating products uh, for multiple companies. So uh, it is with great honor that I sit on some of these uh, new information, do some beta testing. Um, and as you've seen my articles and in, in the past of, what we've been talking about in getting better patient outcome, uh, I have a passion for clear liner treatments now over 10 years of, of getting a little bit of uh, almost uh, pushing over a thousand cases uh, of, of clear liner treatments, obviously using the Amazon system with multiple modalities uh, in combining treatments with acceleration, with, 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 with even some of the sleep uh, conversations and articles you've seen me in. Um, so my idea of, talking about proper occlusion, proper bite, getting patients into the right treatment and using the products that get us there has always and finally now has resonated well with uh, most all of you. So I thank you for uh, sitting through this and uh, without uh, further uh, time, uh, let's talk about what we know. My Propel experience, my MOPS experience, my clear liner experience using it has been very uh, adamant. Accelerated treatment is, is needed uh, in, in the world of orthodontics. Not just necessarily the idea of acceleration, but rather um, the, the osteoperforations that we talked about in the past, but rather the manual perforations in getting these treatments while you're doing multiple, in this particular case that was published in Dentistry Today, and some of you saw this article uh, last November, was. Uh, talking about doing implants at the same time moving teeth and as I'm moving teeth I'm putting teeth in better position and at the and now my agenda is what to finalize this treatment in a timely manner um, using the the uh, mops technique uh, those of you who at one point were not quite sure does it work does it not work now we know that works multiple case studies multiple journals multiple articles about uh, creating that cytokine activity, creating the tooth movements that are needed in bone and allowing that uh, inflammatory process to help aid the movements uh, just like we would in that uh, implant process, right? We're placing implants uh, and waiting a few months sometimes before we place them, three months sometimes. And during that downtime of waiting to place those implants, the bone is doing what? Uh, becoming uh, a little bit better, the matrix and trabeculase becoming more prominent, and we're able to now place an implant in the nice, uh, dense bone. Well, what happens during that 12 to 14 weeks of downtime as the bone uh, matrix is trying to form? We have that inflammatory process that's happened with the extraction of the tooth. So this type of science is something that has been around uh, for for multiple years uh, in the discovery of it and understanding that cytokine activity, osteoclastic, osteoblastic activity is all needed. And now to use that in moving teeth, 
and to put a pressure point on teeth and kind of create that movement using either coil liners or wire brackets is what we're talking about. And follow up, two years, three years, four years follow up on these patients, they get better dense bone. They actually have more stable uh, holding contacts on teeth and more more stabilized occlusion. So that relapse that we sometimes experience with patients right away um, or in years down at the line, it typically ends up having a much better dense bone and a much better proper occlusion as you you uh, finalize these treatments. And so the the minimizing the relapse is now has something that I've been seeing and I've been experiencing post treatment of mops. And it's important because in publication after publication, uh, the looking at these cases one year, two year, three year, four year, five years into it, now I'm actually pushing my my fifth year with using mop technique and and three years into it with the uh, vibration in looking at the high frequency vibration and looking at the mops, you see the stabilization of bone, and these patients uh, have and just taking a cone beam of before, during, and after treatment um, in that three to four year time span, you get to actually see um, the density. You get to see a complete change in the patient's structure, um, soft tissue, hard tissue, and most importantly, looking at these patients. So these publications are there not just as reading material for what a great case this was, but just to follow up what happened to this patient. Um, when we first started and having a timeline of the treatment because the clinical integration of any processes, products that you bring to your practice, we've discussed this before, your entire team has to know how much time do I allow? What does it take? How long is my visit? So in my practice, my initial consultation is actually the one that takes the most amount of time, uh, as I call my intake. So my first visit talking about the patient's treatment, looking at the photos, the full mouth x-rays. Um, those of you who have uh, a, a scanner of some sort, I use the iTero or, or a cone beam. Uh, I, those are what takes time to kind of talk to the patient as to what we're doing. Then we follow up with the periodontal uh, uh, evaluation and whether or not this patient's uh, teeth can handle movements. Do they have bone loss? Is there a, a, a significant uh, pocketing? Looking at these uh, treatment planning processes, that's sometimes two to three hours that we're spending with this patient. Now, I know some of you say I can do a quick consult, bring them back and seat them again. That's fine, whichever works for you, but it's the setup of that initial visit and of setting up the patient's expectation that's important because what we're going to talk about to the patient about is, look, it is not about acceleration. It is not about changing your trays every three or four or five days. Regardless, we're changing trays once every week anyway. It's predictability of tooth movements. Of us, sometimes a tooth doesn't want to rotate. It goes outside the parameter of what a plastic aligner can do or even wire and brackets. And when you go outside that parameter, therefore, we need some auxiliaries. And in my particular case, I use either mops or high frequency vibration. And this is part of our treatment. So it's not that we give the patient a decision, hey patient, do you want to have a $600 added to your bill because we want to make life easier and move teeth faster? That makes no sense to a patient. Well, what do you mean? The conversation has to be, here are the intake that we have, photos, x-rays, um, scans, cone beam, whatever you have in your practice, use those as utilization tools and teaching tools for patients that say, Hey, patient, there's a reason why we need to add mops to our armatarium because the teeth that we're moving go outside the parameter. Now, in the cases to come, I will show you in the next slides of which those parameters are and who some of these patients uh, that I have conversation with. Not every patient may need this type of a treatment, but I believe every patient needs to have some sort of an auxiliary of either a high frequency as an aligner seater, because patients do tend to lag in some of their wear time, as well as just making sure teeth are being gripped by aligners. If you're using clear aligners as your treatment uh, modality in getting those movements that are a little bit more, um, uh, I guess I would like to say uh, difficult 
in terms of tooth movements. So the in 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 if you're planning on restorative or you're planning on in this particular case I did on a patient with an implant placement, those types of visits are then also integrated. We talk about those in that initial visit. And by the second visit, we're actually placing attachments, we're doing the mop treatments, we're, we're, we're performing interproximations as needed and delivering the first four or five aligners. That's usually given five week intervals in my practice. Sometimes we push out to six weeks, but typically five week intervals are what we see our patients. If I'm traveling or lecturing, I don't mind pushing a patient six weeks. But that is the way that we are having the patients to make sure that they're wearing their tray every week. We do bring them back at that very first visit, that very first delivery, post-propel, in three weeks, just to evaluate the patient, how they're doing, did the gum heal, uh, any post-op issues. And normally, uh, they, they don't complain anything other than it just feels like a little poke that we do, just like any kind of lidocaine or sometimes periodontal uh, charting when the hygienist kind of probes a little deeper in the gum line. And that lasts anywhere between five to 10 minutes post-treatment, never beyond the 24 hour time period. So we then kind of go through the follow-up visits, you know, what needs to happen every five weeks and checking. In my clinical integration, so, I kind of wanted to make sure you see the different uh, techniques. Now, those of you who've seen this video, uh, be patient, but I kind of want to show what I use in terms of um, getting the, uh, the propel and, and the mops uh, delivered into the patients. Um, normally, I use a, a topical 99% of the time these days because I'm doing multi-quadrants or multiple quadrants at one time, I'm then numbing the patient I'm inf with infiltration of some sort of a, uh, anesthetic. So let me just show you this quick video. So our lovely doctor here who's a volunteer, uh, Lauren has actually had Propel with the hand device, and now she's going to have it with a power driver, and she's going to tell us her experience. So um, we're just going to go through here. I've already turned it on. And you can just go ahead and put right on. You feel a little pressure? Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm already in the bone. I'm going to reverse it, and I reverse that. So basically going in uh, to the patients and giving them full knowledge of what's going to happen. Videos help, pamphlets help. Um, you know, it's been great that the, the patient brochures that's been given to my practice um, from uh, my rep, it, I, they've been very informative. And patients kind of get it because when you see a patient in this particular case, she's a class three case, um, you know, her lower arch is completely forward. Uh, she's got receding gums on, on the cuspids. You can see the anterior teeth on number nine and is, is kind of collapsed a bit, um, edge to edge bite. We kind of look at these patients in a way of, should this be a bicuspid extraction? Should this be a, a, a wire and bracket? Is this a, uh, a treatment within the plastic uh, parameters? So those of you doctors who remember my 246 rule, I talk about any teeth less than six millimeters of crowding on the lower arch or upper arch. That means when you can see these little cuspids uh, rotated a bit, in this particular case, you can see her cuspids significantly ro rotated, but you have an overlapping of incisors and overlapping of laterals. That typically, if you just take either a perio probe or just by eye, you can kind of look that there's two millimeters, two millimeters here, maybe one half to two millimeters here, and two here. The overlapping looks within the six millimeter parameter, but the rotation of that cuspid looks significant. As you can see on tooth number 27, um, that the tooth is over 50 or 40 degrees rotated. And from a buccal view, you can see that same rotation, these are going to be difficult to move. Think about the root length on a cuspid, on a lower, and the density of bone. You're going to need to add some sort of an auxiliary. In my world, MOPS is the way to go. Vibration high frequency is the way to go. I either combine the two in treatment or I do individual. In this particular case, we decided on having the MOPS at the time of delivery. As you can see, her upper arch doesn't need much movement. When you get to her clincheck, 
things kind of change, right? So using the ClinCheck, the treatment, uh, the, the uh, TMA, uh, those of you who um, have the 5.0 version or maybe the, the, the 4.0 version, uh, you know, the tooth movement analysis is up here on the upper part of your screen. And as you kind of see from an incisal uh, uh, edge to edge view, you can kind of realize that that rotation of that 27 is going to be a little difficult. The ClinCheck software came back with difficulty movements on rotations of 60 degrees. That's when they light up the TMA, those blue and black buttons light up. The blue button shows that those are extrusions that are needed outside the one millimeter. We know we can extrude half millimeter to a millimeter, and beyond that could be a little difficult. Again, the rotation, of we can get up to 35, 40 degrees. Beyond that's difficult. A lot of IPR, 0.5 IPRs on the lower arch. Why? Because we have to kind of get that lower arch to fit over, at the upper arch to fit over the lower arch. So when you go to the final staging, it looks great. It looks like the trays did magic. There's distillation happening on molars, physically translative movements. You have uppers, not much happening up until aligner 19. After aligner 19, teeth are starting to move. Now, doctors, I set my own clin check requesting some distillation up to one to two millimeters. I think that is predictable. You can use a grid feature in here. You can kind of look where I use a superimpose. You can see about, uh, it's more of a tipping of a millimeter, two millimeter distal. And that tipping allows us a little room. So molars and premolars can get pushed back and the IPR then is more predictable. I do have to, I mean, I'm not gonna bicuspid extraction in this case, but I'll just interproximate it up to 0.5. That's 0.25 on each interproximal tooth surface. Doing that allows me to get a better lower arch formation and the upper arch now I'm going to procline or, or expand, if you will, uh, buckle in trying to get the upper arch to fit over, kind of like that we talk about the lid fitting over the box. And the final staging, you can kind of use your occlusal bite ramps or, or bite tabs. This kind of tells you where your occlusion will be. I can see heavy red occlusion on the cuspids. Why? Because as the lower arch is coming back, the upper arch is proclaiming forward, there could be some collision happening. So to avoid that, I added lingual bite ramps, which you can see those are called the G5 feature on the upper arch, um, kind of lateral to lateral, those little blue um, lingual tabs that you see on the screen. That is automatically designed into the plastic tray. You don't fill that with composite, those of you who know that already, but you simply allow that lingual bite ramps to help you with the curvous feet and help with that lower arch to kind of intrude it down help better gain anterior coupling in finishing in that ideal one millimeter overjet overbite on the anterior um, and, uh, uh, and the anterior coupling. So the agenda, the main agenda here is to get to this final stage. Therefore, I know that the lower arch has movements built in from liner one. The upper arch movements don't start to liner 19. I talk to the patient. Look, patient, in order to get this treatment done, it's going to be where we need to add mops. That's manual osteous perforation. We kind of poke the bone, wake the bone up. It's been sleeping for too long. It's been happy where it is. We're about to change the entire uh, um, architecture. And we like to kind of move this bone around. And we started with the conversation of, you know, that's going to be typically anywhere between five to $600 um, per treatment. Th these patients then are kind of, understand when they see why we're doing and i just simply talked to them i said look this is is a palliative treatment uh but we need to numb the the, the area we do need to definitely rinse the area with some uh, disinfectant disinfectants and we're going to anesthetize just like you would do on a deep cleaning or well, you know kind of make sure that you're not feeling anything when we're creating these manual uh perforations and we call them mops and we're going to go anywhere between a millimeter to three millimeters um uh into the tissue and hit the bone. Patients then kind of understand that this is the process. This has to happen. So you can see in Christina's case, the lower arch we started because nothing was happening for 19 aligners on the upper arch. So we started with the lower arch with the mops. You can kind of see they look like little bee stings there. Um, very healthy patient. She wasn't on any aspirin treatment or any steroid treatments, which are some of the contraindications in doing this. And 
as you can see from the top in August, when we actually did our intake and our initial consult to the Propel uh, and the MOPS, that treatment that we did to April, you can see that the there's not much look like it's happening. Look at the lower arch, the rotation on that cuspid. Okay, look at number 27 on the top of your screen. And right here, you can kind of see from before, okay? I'm sorry, from, from April. April is the, the initial to the August. We kind of got that rotation out. We finally got a little bit of proclination happening, right? Not much happened on the upper arch because we hadn't started yet. So the patient's management and their expectations are important. Look, we, we're creating these spaces, allowing these cuspids and, 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 and teeth to kind of fit in. We're pushing teeth. Your bite's going to change. So when you start to look at this, when we started the upper arch, so now we're doing round two with the upper arch, tooth number 19 has to start, uh, aligner number 19 on, we're doing the upper arch, and we one more time hit the lower because anywhere from 12 to 13 weeks, uh, that stimulation of bone is working. After 14 weeks, you're going in healing mode. So we didn't want to get the bone in that healing mode. We want to keep that active movement. You can see that tooth number 27 has opened up. The proclinations are happening. But now we've got to start with some additional interapproximation and get the upper overjet to fit. And as we kind of go forward by December, which was just a few days ago when I saw her, you can kind of see that the lower arch is coming together the upper arch, we're finally getting that overjet over. The anterior coupling is starting to look a little better. And as we're progressing, we're staying on track because tooth number 27 looks like the rotation is somewhat complete. A little bit more interapproximations needed, needed on the lower arch. And that overjet is going to finally get us in that anterior coupling. So we're kind of staying on track, using MOPS on our side and the treatment that was started. We're looking at, um, you know, less than a year. We're, we're less than, let's see, we started April, May, June, July. So we're, we're six, seven months into the treatment and getting halfway done. And that's what she looks like halfway cooked. Um, her smile line she's excited about. She says she can actually bite into an apple for the first time and grab and just kind of bite off an apple, which was amazing for her. And I kind of laughed at that as well. Dentists having a sign of apple on their cards. Now we know. So from the initial to, to mid-treatment and looking at that lower arch architecture coming together with a cuspid rotation from where she started with a narrow arch. We're kind of helping this process through using the mops. And to me, I couldn't do it any other way. And you're going to notice um, in my follow-up, and we're just in December now, so hopefully we're hoping to be done by March with her. You'll see that I will guarantee the look of that ClinCheck that we first proposed. Um, to her. So the treatment formula is that most patients require at least one treatment um, that if you're having aligner treatments of 20 to 24. That's giving you at least one MOPS in that initial delivery. That's when I like doing it. Um, I put on the attachments. I have them rinse out. I get the IPR done. I rinse again. And then at that point with chlorhexidine, and then at that point, we're um, the patient's already been numbed. We're doing the mops and we're done. Complex cases like this one you saw in Christina's case, um, that would require potentially two treatments. So, you know, we tend to give these patients, you know, the two treatments that won't exceed over uh, X amount of dollars, sometimes anywhere between seven to eight hundred dollars for two treatments, sometimes up to a thousand dollars for the treatments. Um, for two treatments, we kind of combine that in letting them know that. This is kind of needed to get your teeth where they need to be. There's no and or if or buts about it. Um, so the, the, the osteoclastic response is in that four to six millimeters because I want to give at least two or three uh, perforations interproximally in between the roots, interroot uh, treatments, usually on the attached gingiva. Okay. Um, so looking at these cases that last 10 to 12 weeks, um, you, you, Try to get most of your heavy movements and IPR done in that initial 10 to 12 weeks. After the 10 to 12 weeks, if it's a 20 or 24 aligner, the rest is just fine tuning. A lot of your heavy movement is going to happen in that 10 to 12 week timeline, uh, after which is going to be just fine tuning. So unless if you have a 
you know, 34 aligner or 40 aligner, like you saw in my particular case, I know that I'm going to need potentially another treatment. And looking at the perforation sites, again, I like the attached gingiva. I like to, to kind of hit these areas, not necessarily really close to apex, even though that's where the ideal situation or area would be, but they tend to bleed a little bit. And I'll show you some slides on areas that we go in the vestibular area, and that tends to, the patient bleeds a little bit more than normal. Um, so I like to put it on the attached gingiva because as soon as you just take, you uh, perforate, you kind of take the uh, instrument back, the, the um, tip out, you just get a small little bit of bleeding, then you wipe with a gauze or you have them lit rinse and it stops right away. Versus in the vestibular area, you know, there's still some blood coming, just like how we give these uh, uh, injections, infiltrations. So looking at this particular patient, and by the way, that's the circle that you see there is where the injection site was. That wasn't where we propelled. We actually did the uh, MOPS here on the attached gingiva. Uh, looking at this uh, uh, patient on Nushin's case, one of my biggest concern was the disharmony of where the bone and teeth are related on tooth number 28 going to 31. So if you look at it, it looks like it's kind of sitting off the bone. It needs to be tipped in. Number 27 needs to be rotated out. So she's within the aligner parameters, but she's got a crowding. And then if you can see distal of number seven with spacing. And once we start to procline these teeth forward and making them look a little nicer, guess what we're going to see? We're going to see some black triangles. And these black triangles are going to really be prominent because we haven't really, if we don't IPR, we, we're gonna put these teeth in this, they got, she got a V-shaped looking teeth and we're gonna have a lot of black triangles. So if you can see already her smile has the potential of having uh, spaces that are gonna look very evident uh, because of that black triangle. And we discussed with her of potentially doing uh, another, uh, you know, a, a set of mops and maybe potentially doing it in one sitting and it'll be all done. Her biggest concern was um, she was afraid. She was worried that she's gonna have pain and is it gonna hurt? And we convinced her, no, it'd be fine. We do this all the time, but no matter how much you convince patients, they don't believe you. So uh, we kind of looked at the clin check together um, and I explained to her, look, we can start moving the bottom teeth. I've got to add some into approximation because once your teeth procline forward, you're gonna have what's called a black triangle. It's this is gonna look nice. So I'm gonna treat lower and upper separately. One's a crowding. We've gotta get the lower crowding out of the way. One's a spacing. And some of your difficulty teeth movements are where the teeth don't necessarily fit on the ridge. They don't sit right on the bone. They kind of sit buckled to it and your upper arch sits buckled to it as well. So as soon as I start pushing these in, which we're gonna see is we're gonna see that this spacing on the upper is not gonna get closed as nicely. So we're gonna to have to bring the lower arch uh, and tighten up the lower arch and then the anteriors then I will bring and lingualize so we don't get that anterior coupling that's gonna hit you edge to edge bite. Because typically what happens with the, <coughs> excuse me, a lower crowding is you procline forward and upper spacing you bring back. So you tend to, collide on the anterior and get a posterior open bite. So to avoid that, the decision of interproximation was made and we decided we're gonna do it later in the stage, not necessarily up front, but I wanna get that spacing closed and give me some room so that coupling would be ideal. So we're gonna treat upper and lower arch separately. We're gonna do the propel on the lower arch, no problem. And as we get closer to the upper arch, uh, we will then at that point start with the upper arch propel uh, and using the mops and uh, uh, technique. And so this is pretty much where we uh, decided on the clinch check. If you can see now, the upper arch is going to be treated separately. So once we got the lower arch in better harmony, so in the next phase, this is in her follow-up, we got her to that point. Now we're going to get the upper arch treated. So the agenda here was starting with the lower arch, getting the interapproximations out of the way, getting the teeth in much better position, and then we'll start with the upper arch at a later point, which was after the 10th aligner, and kind of putting this, and this is what we kind of talk about with patients mid-treatment, that you can see 
we knew that as if we didn't do enough IPR, which this is no IPR done on the lower arch right now, you should see the black triangles. We can see what's happening. The space is closing, but you have a little bit of collision between teeth number seven, eight, 26, uh, and 25. So as soon as we intrude and put the lingual bite ramps, we're going to get the better occlusion and this posterior open bite closes. But I went into it knowing this is going to happen. And my agenda was not to necessarily interproximate the lower arch till I absolutely need to, to get that anterior coupling ideal in that one millimeter overbite. over bite. So if you look at the start time uh, and to where we're at in November, it, we, we're really in that short amount of time made a lot of progress. You can see the lower arch is starting to look a little nicer. We still have to tuck in the premolars and, and molars a bit. And the upper arch, we have to kind of expand a bit more so we can fit over the tooth numbers 28 to 31, as we discussed earlier. Midline was something that I may not win on. So we kind of, at the very front, told her we may not win on this midline, um, which she was fine with. Uh, we're going to close up these, um, inter close up the uh, black triangles. So one of the key tips that I always tell doctors is teach your hygienist to educate patients in what an overlapping or crowding means. Patients may not know what overlapping or crowding means. And using just a simple perio probe can explain, look, this goes outside the parameter of the plastic aligners. And we're going to use some auxiliaries. We use mops. You know, we use the, 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 the high frequency. We use different products. We may have to interproximate your teeth. So this is to get you there. It's not just about the clear aligners. That's a given. But the car still needs an engine, needs tires. It needs a, a gearbox to move it. So to me, it's not just putting a plastic piece on the teeth and Hail Mary that it's going to move. Um, it, we need to be active in these types of treatments. And every five to six weeks, we've got to track these patients. So once patients see what we're talking about, just a simple little perioprobe, now it's easier to have the conversation. We then go talk about our tier level pricing. In my practice, uh, my advanced cases are in, I'm in California. So some of you are, I know in New York or other parts of the state that are listening, your fees may be a little higher, but I'm, I'm about an advanced case, which is uh, typically more than your 12 to 14 aligners. Um, so you, we know that we have the Invisalign light, which is 14 aligners or less, but mine, anything beyond 14 aligners would be considered advanced. That's four millimeters or more, six millimeters or more. So you can see that I've actually put greater than six millimeters here so patients can see. Um, I did give you these forms last time. Um, they're in Word document. You can download these. You can just go on a tie.com. Just download these forms. There's no uh, need for you to give me any uh, uh, credit card. Uh, but uh, it's just uh, for you to kind of, uh, doctors always ask, where do I get that form? Where do I get this? So I've loaded that for you. You can download and modify pricing and tier level. So I talk about moderate case of less than six. Again, we've ch now changed it to four millimeters or less because we're getting so many cases that kind of go outside the plastic parameters because now we're getting referrals from other patients of their friends who need help. And typically, they're, they're not the minor tooth movements. They happen to be a little bit more advanced movements. So looking at the moderate pricing, we kind of put in this entire information of how, uh, what the cost would be, how we can do it, and retainers are always extra. And then we go into our treatment form or payment option form. And this has our level pricing that carries right over, whether they hit a moderate level or advanced level pricing. In this particular case, level one would be the the, the, the moderate level, and then the, the propel or the mops or the aligner seater. Um, we typically charge per quadrant, but in, 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 in we can always give the patient, if they start today, a flat fee. So I kind of break down what the cost of retainers are, if they have an insurance, dental insurance, or flex spending. And at that point, I'm more than happy to apply a discount for starting that day, which tends to kind of fit into their budget um, and and it, it helps so very strategically we are telling them per quadrant it's between four or five hundred dollars to to have this type of treatment done and it's needed because you go outside the, the regular basic case however today 
we're going to go ahead and discount you X amount. Um, so we always do that in giving at least our, our, when our costs are paid, then we're more than happy to do the treatments. I know some of you uh, are familiar with billing uh, the insurance. That's fine. You can bill per quadrant. If I ever bill an insurance for the alveoplasty and non-extraction of teeth, uh, I've always write the words in conjunction with orthodontics. I'm very clear in that I'm using this treatment for orthodontic purposes. So it's, you know, alveoplasty with extraction of, with non-extraction of teeth in conjunction with orthodontics. And I always like to put down using, um, I even go even more to clear up. And we typically bill one quad. We don't bill all four quads. It, it eats up away the general benefits. So some of you doctors have asked me about insurance. Um, you know, it, it depends on the benefits. You have to check that and see if that's the coverage or not, because some insurance companies don't consider that um, uh, in the conjunction with orthodontics as part of the treatment. So we always talk to the patient uh, before they come in. So again, you can see in Jeff's case, very difficult teeth movements, very narrow arch on the posterior, rotations, uh, crowding that doesn't seem too bad, but look at where that premolar sitting off the ridge. Um, this particular case is definitely an advanced case. We've got an omega-shaped upper arch. You can clearly see that. And, you know, I typically try to talk to these patients about the overlapping that, you know, and I just saw a question, question come through, and I'll answer your questions right after this presentation, um, that um, we, 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 you're going to need to have some sort of uh, mobs done and we're going to do one treatment. We're going to wait 12 weeks and if we need another treatment, we'll go ahead and do it. Going, Looking at this patient, I know he's going to need two treatments. I know that his uh, aligner staging was 42 aligner staging. We change the trays once every week. That's still 42 weeks. So 42 weeks of treatment is at least going to yield one to two mops. So Jeff, Wire and brackets are an option for you. Orthodontic referral is an option for you. He's been a patient of mine for a very long time. And he said, I wanted to make sure you know what you're doing. You did my son. You did my wife. I had done one of their neighbors. So he's like, okay, now I'm ready. You can, you can present my case to, to your doctors. I'm ready to do it. And he actually uh, was okay with having two treatments of MOPS done, uh, which, would, which actually cost him $1,000 more on the treatment. Uh, because he understood he had done actually consults behind my back. I know he did. Uh, so looking at his case, uh, our agenda would be to, and you can, oh, by the way, he forgot to mention that he did aspirin treatment. So I want to show you this horror, horror bloody slide. It's not, they rinse off and it goes away and the patient has no clue what's going on. But I wanted to kind of show you what it looks like with aspirin uh, treatments on patients. He forgot to mention that he's taking 80 milligrams a day for us. So we put the attachments on, we did the IPR, we had them rinse, numbed them up. My, in California, our hygienists can numb. So once you numbed, I went in there, got my propel, walked out and came back and I said, uh, did we rinse him? She goes, no, he forgot to mention he's got uh, asthma treatment. So sure enough, no problem. You can see that from molar to molar, uh, two perforations were done. He lived to talk to the, the day. As we start to get the lower crowding, we can see how you can see how the lower arch is starting to fit a little better. Um, you can see the upper arch is starting to get that omega shape out of the way now. You can see that tooth number 12 and 14 is fitting a little better. Anterior coupling is coming back. And once we're done with this expansion, we're going to settle the bite. And again, looking at the initial, so take a look at the initial one more time, the narrow where the it wouldn't have been done without me working on the bone. This would have been a liner tracking nightmare. Um, and so from March, when his initial intake was, a month later, we got the aligners. April, we actually did the propel. And here we are in August, he's on track. And to me, that's a very nice presentable case. Um, so we, we are really uh, allowing these treatments um, to be more predictable with plastic aligners and number nine is starting to rotate in. So I got two questions. Let me see, let me get one of these questions out of the way. Um, our Propel rep received waiting for mops until they're worn the first aligner. Is it okay to do attachments, initial delivery visit? Okay, I'm, I'm guessing um, 
the question is at what point do we do we do the propel look if there's no real magic formula i like doing it at the time of delivering of the attachments ipr i rinse them out uh with the chlorhexidine and then do the propel that first visit because I'm lecturing a lot and I'm on the road. So I not, I need to know when we did the propel. And in my mind, it's always on the initial start. That doesn't mean that you you don't have to start in the middle of the treatment. You can maybe if your track aligner is tracking fine. And again, if those of you who are using Invisalign, they did away with the charge of the word refinement. It's just additional aligners up to five years. We can order that. So, you know, you can actually go ahead and order these trays um, and then start to propel or retroactively go ahead and if you everything's tracking fine you're having an issue um i like perforating all teeth i don't want to just do one molar or one cuspid that's hard because those tips are disposable you can't use those tips um you know for for uh again and again you can't sterilize them so i just you know as a, as a standard i start from molar to mesial to the molar mesial to the uh, uh molar on the other part of the arch basically in the bicuspid area forward um, using both upper and lower arch unless if there's no movement on the upper arch doing the lower then coming back in the upper so that's that's my my ideal um, the other question is do you propel every two to three months for difficult movements no again uh, my propel treatment time is 12 to 14 weeks interval typically one patient is needed then the next patient would then go through um and and uh we do the next one in 14 uh, at same patient in 12 to 14 weeks so let me continue with our um vibration and then i'll come back with the conversation uh with propel uh because i know there's a few questions coming in so as far as the high frequency vibration uh one of the key important parts is understanding that this is an aligner cedar in my world, it allows me the five hundred dollars a day, and you know the patient costs of what they're paying. A, it allows me to make sure that the patient's wearing their trays and the fit is always good. And B, uh, for the cost, it's it, it's it's really worth the compliance, right? Because they were changing the liner every week. But if it's not tracking well, um, the patient doesn't come in right away. Versus at least this aligner seater. It allows me that every five weeks I'm seeing for five minutes a day a better, um, I guess I could say, tracking with the plastic aligners. So obviously, if you stop tracking, if you get that little space between aligner and tooth, you have to take off the attachments. You got to either scan or take an impression two to four weeks downtime and, you know, put on the attachments again. And here we are starting over again. And that, you know, you're, you're off almost a month, month and a half um, to start the tray again. Uh, so using the uh, V-Pro uh, or the high frequency in my office, it allows me to seat the aligners. There's no downtime. Right away, the patients, you can see where the areas are not tracking. Um, it sits in. I typically use this retroactively. So I see the patients are kind of getting that little spacing. I do a little interapproximation. I hand on the V-Pro. Uh, but if we've already included it in our treatment, so typically we tell them that, you know, if you go ahead and, and there, that your case seems to be not as difficult, you don't need to have as much movement built in, you have less than four millimeters of, of, of crowding, we then at that point talk about doing the B-Pro, much better than doing those chewies. So in this particular case, you can see our patient, um, Carol, she came in. The molars were tracking okay, bicuspid was tracking okay, then all of a sudden the lateral and the incisors were not tracking. You can see that spacing happening. And one of the conversations I had with her was, are you wearing the trays? She says, I am. I believed her. I said, okay. I checked the interapproximation. There were spaces. What's happening here is if you look at clearly, we have what's called power ridges. Those allow the roots to kind of tip forward. And then there's also lingual bite ramps on the back of her teeth. So in her case, we're pushing teeth out and we're trying to uh, do a lingual bite ramp of the lower arch that hits against it to intrude. So you're doing two different movements that are, that are counterproductive, but I needed it because she was a bicuspid extraction. She had a history of missing bicuspids and I needed to, over, to create this better overjet. 
So that spacing happened, not necessarily because of patient compliance, but because what we're trying to get the aligner to do. So um, even if I get her new trays, same thing could happen. So to fit the tray on, we need, I need something for them. Either they put their thumb all night and day and push it up there or using the high frequency vibration. So just let me show you her clean check first so you can understand what, what I was just saying earlier is that we've got the power ridges, those are the blue lines on the anterior part of the teeth. That allows, she had a deep bite. I wanted to go ahead and put a lingual bite ramp on her to procline the teeth forward and correct the curvacy on the lower arch. So we've got two movements that are all root related and potentially this patient's deep bite can get resolved. But what's gonna end up happening is that we're gonna end up having tray that may not be as, as flexible, right? So I'm going to need to put that uh, mops isn't really the issue here, but rather this fit of the aligner. Um, and it wasn't that I needed more attachments on the incisors. So with her case, I added the uh, high frequency as part of our treatment. And you can see that when it stopped tracking, uh, I, I told her, look, we may have to come back and, and visit this conversation uh, with, with uh, using this vibration. And she's at the very first, said, no, I'm okay with it. I don't need it. And then sure enough, she comes in and that's what she looks like. Uh, I think it was three, four weeks into their treatment. So right away, since we already had the conversation with her, uh, we then at that point uh, handed her the V-Pro. She, I think at that time, handed us 400 bucks. Um, so we were okay with, and you can see within minutes and in the office, she started wearing it five minutes. It just, boom, slapped right in. Because it wasn't that the contacts were tight. It was just that we're trying to get that a better fit of the aligner. And once the aligner fits, then the teeth are predictably moving. So, uh, you know, the patient was very excited that to see this, that we were right and it worked because she would say, I press one part of the tray, it would tip the other way. I would press another side of the tray, it would tip another way. And sure enough, it sat for her instantaneously once we got that far. So she was very excited about that. Um, and here she is, uh, it, you know, now we're on track. It was December, she came in. These were the lingual bite mounts we talked about. Same aligners from day one. There's the uh, uh, the anterior portion. You can see the little divots called the power ridges that are put in. And this patient's uh, on track. Everything's coming along beautifully. So what with that uh, information, what I'd like to do, uh, and oh, by the way, what's great about it is you can actually uh, assign the patient and you can actually access all this data. So this is, that's also great about uh, having this type of process. Um, so I know that some of you have some questions. So I wanna answer your questions and I'll go back and finalize our slides. So um, the other question was, do I propel all my patients? So no. I propel all my patients that are difficult patients. So any pr treatment parameter outside of four millimeters on lower crowding, a deep bite of greater than four millimeters. Um, if I have an overjet greater than four millimeters, meaning the teeth are sticking forward and I need to either bring them back or I need to kind of get some rotations greater than 35 degrees, uh, those are my propel patients. How many of my patients are those? I got to tell you, man, it seems like 90% of them. <laughs> so it looks like I'm propelling almost all my patients to answer your question. Who do I not propel? Uh, sometimes some express cases. Uh, I do very minimal express cases. But if I'm doing a veneer setup and I need to maybe do a scenario uh, where I have to actually digitize uh, some sort of a uh, product like a veneer, um, I can show you, for instance, in Myrtle's case, um, this was a case where we had lower crowding. She had a history of bicuspid extractions. So I only really needed the lower arch. Um, so this was a great V pro case. Um, I can kind of go through, uh, as you can see, the clin check kind of showed us where she had some of a, a deep bite. So this one didn't really need the, the propel. I was putting on lingual bite ramps. This is a great V pro case where I needed to make sure she cooperates and in five minutes a day, it's easier. Um, but you can see some of those movements are a little bit more, not necessarily advanced, but it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm going into a parameter where I need to get better anterior coupling. So once we did that, I knew that I was going to finalize with the 
um, veneers. So I digitized uh, wax up. I use the uh, iTero. So um, it's easy for me to kind of do all digital and my lab and I work really well uh, in getting these veneers done. So um, it, this is all done without a wax up. It's all done digital. The upper arch was done, the lower arch, now she wants to have that done. So cases like this, not necessarily a propel case, but more of a V Pro case. So I've kind of gotten used to knowing who are the harder treatment parameters that I need to get in line with uh, mops and who are the ones that are not, um, that I only need V Pro. But for all patients, it's one or the other. Uh, I thought that a few, uh, so another question, hello, I thought a few of the lower premolars you did mops on were only on one entry point. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah, so I know, basically the question is that I noticed, she noticed this uh, particular doctor that on some of the um, perforations, they were a single perforations, not two. That is true. Um, it's on the attached gingiva. So if I have attached gingiva, so let's go back to that um, slide with the mops. Uh, then I'm doing two or sometimes even three. But if I got, so if you take a look here, um, you can see that, you know, sometimes you get close. If you got, if I go to see the vestibular pull right there, if I go too far in, the mental nerve for Amen might be there. So you can see some of the areas we just hit one, right? Um, in other parts, if I have more room, I can hit them with two. So you can see there's two that was hit here, two that was hit here. Um, so, you know, it really depends on uh, the patient's um, gingival, um, I guess I can say, contour, as well as the attached gingiva. So you can see there's two here, there's only one put here between the cuspids. And, and since I knew I was in this particular case, I was hitting her twice in the, another 12, 14 weeks when we we're going to do the upper arch on Christina, I was okay with just having one in some areas. All right, um, the next question here. Yeah, I think I answered, uh, so uh, do I propel two to three months? Yeah, so I pretty much, I have about 12 to 14 week time intervals is what, what my time intervals are um, for these cases. All right, let me go ahead and finalize our, if there's any other questions, this will be a perfect time to ask. What I'm going to do is just kind of give you some uh, final information that we talked about. And I want to kind of use this quote. I know that, um, you know, uh, everybody knows about Amazon. And uh, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, had a quote, and I thought it was kind of nice to say. He said, if you build a great experience, customers tell each other about that. Word of mouth is, every, is very powerful. So my practice has been built on word of mouth. If you guys Google my name, Atai, you see some of my lectures, some content, and my listing on, uh, I think on, on Google search, I'm probably number four or five down there. I'm not the highest up. Why that is because I get patients talking about other patients. You know, patients are bringing other patients. And uh, that word of mouth is what our entire practice has been built on. So using these type of products, using more predictable movements, it allows me and allows my practice to kind of navigate um, making sure that I'm on top of every uh, facet in dentistry that has to be given to my patients and that they appreciate. Wait, may it be digitizing, may it be acceleration or more predictable movements or high frequency. Every one of these treatments uh, protocols are experiences that has taken me a year, two years, three years, now 20 plus years of dentistry is I'm still learning. So tomorrow, some other product line might come in that's that's helping my patients. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to try it. And I'm going to evaluate it. I'm, as I said, five years into using this, this product line and mops and, and, and five frequency, I was the first naysayer that, are you kidding me? We're going to do what with this bone? How is this going to work? I was the very first naysayer. And here I am now talking about it. And almost every other patient is getting this treatment done. So I appreciate your time, doctors. If there's any questions, um, I will give you my email and give you my information that you can go ahead and email me directly at doctor.atai.com. Uh, I have a clinical resources section um, entirely set up, and I know some of you have some CEs that you're going to get after this event. 
Um, so you're more than, uh, uh, that'll be sent over to you and the CE information will be also given to you uh, post um, webinar. So if there's any other questions, I'll go ahead and take them. Otherwise, I'm going to allow you to enjoy your holidays and enjoy the family time. Uh, I know those of you who have been on listening to me ramble on, I really, really appreciate it. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them post uh, webinar. Thank you again, doctors. And until next year, we'll put together some more information. We'll get some more uh, data and I'll show you some of these cases that are finished now that I pulled for December timeline, hopefully by March and we'll have uh, a big before and after showcase for you. Thanks again. Have great holidays.